pleural fluid cytology. So some clinical history to begin with. The patient in question is a 90 year old female. She presented with acute shortness of breath um, and had a reduced exercise tolerance. She also had a productive cough, but with no hemoptysis. There was no past medical history to note. And from her drug history, she was only found to be taking paracetamol on occasion for joint pain. Social history reveals that she is quite well for her age um, and she lives on her own with family support and her daughter has the power of attorney. On examination in A&E, she was found to have reduced air entry of her left lung and bilateral leg swelling as main um, examination findings. On admission, she had a number of investigations. Microbiology-wise, she was negative for COVID and her urine sample did not grow anything in particular. From her bloods, um, it was identified that she had a very high white cell count, as well as a very raised CRP. The clinical team did also do um, some malignant markers, such as CEA and AFP, and both of those were within normal range. Radiology-wise, the chest x-ray showed a large left-sided pleural effusion uh, with left lobe collapse as well. As a result, she had a CT cap, and that also confirmed the large left effusion, which was drained with a chest strain, but also showed some right lower lobe small PEs as well, and left pelvic retroperitoneal nodules. Pleural fluid was collected and sent for cytological analysis. So here we have the PAP slide um, showing two magnifications, times 20 and times 40. And what we can essentially see and what we have reported is that these are cellular fluid preparations that have included red blood cells, a few lymphocytes, and many predominantly scattered large epithelioid cells with vacuolated cytoplasm and large, occasionally multiple, pleomorphic nuclei indicating a malignant diffusion. Here we have the Gimster stain, also at two magnifications, times 20 and times 40. And we can also appreciate these pleomorphic epithelioid looking cells and also some mitosis present as well at a much higher magnification, indicating that this does in fact appear to be malignant. So just working through this case, we'll have a poll now to ask the question based on cytology that we've just seen. Yeah, so the polls just appeared and it's uh, just what you can see on the slide. So based on morphology, what do you think this could be? Is it reactive? Uh, could it be mesothelioma, uh, adenocarcinoma or something else? So we'll just give that a few seconds to, to acquire acquire the results. Okay, so Kristen has shared the poll results, very interesting spread actually. So um, reactive mesothelial proliferation 20%, mesothelioma 19%, adenocarcinoma 49%, most popular, and other 11%. Very interesting. Okay, so let's move on. Yes, it's, this is not. Sorry, I'll just go back. I think that should work. Okay. Indeed, we were worried about a carcinoma at this point. So, to further our investigations, we did a cell block. And this again confirmed large pleomorphic cells some even appearing vacuolated. Some were even hypochromatic, 
there was visible nucleoli, and mitosis could also be seen as well. Raising our suspicions further of a carcinoma. Indeed. Okay, so we did our initial immunocytochemistry panel, initially to differentiate between an adenocarcinoma and mesothelioma, but also in an elderly woman with an unknown cause for large prolifusion and with TTF1 immunos being negative, we need to consider breast cancer as a top differential. Hence, we also did GATA3, which showed strong diffuse positivity. Our initial impression is that this was more likely going to be breast cancer, but we need to also consider that with GATA3, there is a chance that it could also be tumor or malignancy could also be originating from the urinary tract. On this slide here, we have some panels of immunos that we conducted, and it is quite clear the difference between MOC31 positivity and calretinin negativity. You can also see that GATA3 is positive as well as our um, cytokeratin MNF116. So at this point, we decided to investigate the breast cancer angle in more detail. We also contacted uh, the medical team looking after the patient and advised them on our diagnostic thought process so perhaps they could conduct a breast examination. However, and interestingly, both ER and PR staining were negative. So here you can see in the panels you've got ER being showing hardly any staining as well as PR. Um, and this came initially as a small surprise to us. We have another poll now. So given what you've just heard and being on this sort of clinical journey, what would you do at this point? A, ask clinicians to consider. So there you go, you can see those. Discuss the case of the clinicians, run further immuno, or just leave the report as it is with a, a GATA3 positive tumour. Leave that for a few seconds. Ah, there you go. So 68% would discuss the case further and get further history or possibly uh, further examination findings or other investigations. 32% would run further immunohistochemistry and, and nobody at all would leave the report as it is, which is very commendable, I have to say. So. Instead of further investigations. Oh. Be run okay, so here we go. So further discussion with the medical team they went back and did a CT abdomen and pelvis, and this helped them identify a left lower pole mass measuring 55 by 48 millimeters with some pararenal infiltrative disease and nodules, um, highlighting the importance here of um, cytology in being able to identify the primary cause of this lady's large left-sided perfusion. Indeed, we decided to run a further immuno panel. We did CK7, CK20, CK5, P40, Vimentin, Pax8, and CA9. Clearly trying to find now with the GATA3 being positive, whether this could be coming from the urinary tract. And what we found is that CK7 and CK20 were strongly diffusely positive uh, staining. But also, we found that Vimentin, Pax8, and CA9 were all negative. Now, with the GATA3 being positive and the CK7 and 20 being positive, we started to favor a urothelial carcinoma rather than a renal cell carcinoma. Also, we did do CK5 and P40, um, and we do know that 
transitional cell carcinoma can have similar antigenicity as squamous cell carcinoma. And here they did show a 10% um, of, of cells sorry, were positive um, for the stains. So here are some immunocytochemistry panels showing CK7 and CK20 diffuse positivity, as well as CK5 and P40, where 10% of those cells were locally positive. And here we have the uh, immunocytochemistry for CA9 and PAX8. And uh, it's quite clear that they are both very negative as compared to the last slide when we saw the strong positivity for CK7, CK20. So just to summarize here at this point, we're thinking of the tumor or malignancy is likely to be coming from a urothelial carcinoma rather than from a renal cell carcinoma. So for me personally, there was a lot of important points to take away. Firstly, being systematic um, throughout this case was very important. So for example, understanding um, what the cytology showed and ordering the appropriate immunos. So being able to differentiate between an adenocarcinoma and an mesothelioma. And once you've established that potentially this is a carcinoma, being able to do the right immunos, depending on where you think the source is. Secondly, not every cohesive group of epithelial cells are going to be adenocarcinoma or mesothelial. And finally, remembering that GATA3 is not only positive in the breast, but also can be positive in the urinary tract symptom, uh, system. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's listening in today. I'd also like to thank my supervisor, uh, Dr. Maddox um, and Dr. Malhotra, uh, who is a radiologist who kindly provided us with the images, as well as all the Department of Cellular Pathology at West Heart. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Tony, for facilitating that presentation. Has anyone got any questions? Uh, hello, ma'am. I have a question, please. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. We'd normally put questions into chat, but if you, Venus, you're on your microphone now, if you want to just ask the question, that's fine. Uh, we consider. Okay, sorry. I, I will check. Thank okay. you. Okay, no problem. So it stunned everybody, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, at the moment there's, there's nothing in chat there. No. If anyone wants to put in, uh, we can always come back to that one. The fact that it was a recorded presentation, and um, we might Mom, be able can to I address ask a it. Yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, suppose the immunohistochemistry panel. In this case, we got CK7 and 20 and GATA3 positive. Yeah. Suppose we get only CK7 positive and 20 negative, yeah. and GATA3 positive. Can we still take it as a urothelial carcinoma, sir? Well, it's just, um, it just becomes less likely. It's a question of, you know, um, melding all the probabilities together. Obviously, if something, in an elderly woman, if a priori, if you have something that's CK7 positive, 20 negative, and GATA3 positive, it's still um, most likely to be breast. Um, but, you know, if, if there is no breast cancer, and all you <laughs> is a tumour in, um, in the urinary tract, then you, you'd have to go with what the clinical, um, you know, data suggests. But, but, you know, that amino profile is going to be breast most of the time in a woman. Okay. 
So I've not, I can't see anything else in, in chat there. So Tony, we might move on to the next case, please. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Winnie Tang, who's the lead biomedical scientist for diagnostic cytology. Uh, and I'll hand over to her now. Sorry, let me just share screen again. Let's get to share screen. Um, right. And then, um, sorry. Yeah, I think it is. Sorry. Yeah. And then, okay. Hello, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, I'm one of the BMSs here at West Hart and uh, I'll be giving a presentation on reporting urines with the Paris classification from a BMS perspective. A bit of background on our department, but currently we have two BMSs with a Diploma in Expert Practice for non gynae Cytology. And to enable the BMSs to report independently, we needed to establish a governance structure. And our initial focus was on urines, so that because we were looking to adopt the Paris system for reporting these urines. And to establish our governance structure and to enable all the staff who would report urine specimens to gain experience in using the Paris classification, we performed a review of 75 cases. And from this, uh, all who reported the urines would take part in the review. And as a reporting structure, we established that if both BMSs were present, uh, one would act as the primary screener and the other would act as a secondary screen, very much like in cervical cytology. And if one BMS was absent for whatever reason, uh, all the cases would be passed on to either a trainee pathologist uh, and or consultant and they would act as the secondary screen. And all non-negative cases would be passed on to the trainee pathologist then on to the consultant. So a bit of background about the Paris system. It was published in 2016. It consists of seven categories, which I will show you later. But for each category, there is a clear criteria. And the primary consideration is the NC ratio. And according to this system, um, if the uh, NC ratio is less than 0.5, the cases should be reported as negative. And um, we introduced this into our department earlier on this year. And as I mentioned before, it involved reviewing 75 cases and allocating each one to one of the seven Paris categories. And th like, this was done with everyone that would report urines. And at the time of the review, that consisted of three consultants two trainee pathologists and two BMSs. And the majority of cases, we did reach consensus, but there were a few outliers, which we'll discuss later. Now, these are the, for those who don't use the Paris system, these are the seven categories that we have. They're inadequate, negative for high-grade urethelial carcinoma, atypical urethelial cells, suspicious for high-grade, high-grade urethelial carcinoma, low-grade, and other malignancies. Now, I'll discuss some key features for each of these categories. For the negative ones, anything with an uh, NC ratio of less than 0.5 will be in this category. And um, for atypical cases which demonstrate at least 0.5, plus one of the other listed features here, would be classed in the atypical category. Um, high grade, anything above 0.7 and with hyperchromasia plus one of the other two, coarse chromatin or irregular chromatin ring, would be put into the high grade category. But uh, if there are less than 10 abnormal cells in the sample, you cannot put it in the high grade category. It needs to go in the suspicious for high grade. And that's just to do with the number of cells. And for low grade, there is not a requirement for uh, 
high NC ratio, it's the presence of fibrovascular cores. If a sample does not have fibrovascular cores, it cannot go into low grade. It goes into the negative high grade urethelial carcinoma, which is one of the more counterintuitive uh, grades that I've found. Now, um, we have a poll here. So, the question is, can you identify which of these four cells has a ratio of 0.5? So, is it A, B, C, or D? Okay, let's have a look. We're just uh, waiting for the results to come in. We'll give it about 10 more seconds, Winnie, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, interesting results. 5% thought it was A, 8% thought it was B, 31% thought it was C, and the vast majority, 56%, thought it was D. And I think uh, the, the correct answer is actually C. So um, from, that, from that result, we can see how difficult it is to assess the NC ratio, which is very important for putting the sample into the, the correct category. So, um, so what experience have I had with um, this system? Well, basically, uh, coming from a background of cervical cytology, I've noticed that for diagnostic cytology, there is a more variable appear normal appearance for um, diagnostic uh, samples. And that means it can be very counterintuitive to put certain samples into a negative for high grade category because to me negative means negative not negative but high but low grade cannot be excluded which according to the para system if um, there are no fiber vascular cores but you see some increase in nc ratio but less than 0.5 it cannot go into an atypical category it has to go into the negative for high grade and I think the statement that they have negative for high grade urethelial carcinoma is sort of uh, indicates that low grade cannot be excluded. But if you use that system, you can actually add text to the report to say low grade cannot be excluded. And with using the power system, it's just getting my head around that any ethical report must have an NC ratio greater than 0.5. And from the poll earlier, how difficult it is to actually identify uh, the NC ratio as 0.5, because 0.5 and 0.4 looked very similar in that poll. So let me go on to some of the cases that we reviewed. This is case one, it is an 83 year old female the urine sample was a uteric urine sample. This is at low power. So you can see it's modestly cellular. Now, uh, on closer examination, let me see if I can get the pointer up. We've got some cells with a potentially increased NC ratio here. Uh, the, the, the cells there with another one which could be high NC ratio, another group there. So very densely populated crowded group here. Not so crowded, some nucleoli present, a bit foamy. Uh, so, some more clusters of cells. Can you what are what what do you think the NC ratio is there? Just so the poll I have here is, according to the PARA system, what would you class this as? Negative for high grade, atypical, suspicious, high grade urethelial, low grade urethelial neoplasm, or other. So the poll should be coming. So if you 
submit your answer. I'll give another 10 seconds or so, Winnie. Yeah, that's great. I know it's a bit tricky assessing NC ratio on a screen as well. Okay, so we had 6% for negative for high grade, 17% for atypical, 37% for suspicious, 31% for high grade, 4% for low grade, and 5% for other. Now that looks like a very good spread of answers and that kind of mimicked what um, we got when we reviewed it. When we reviewed it, it was originally reported as suspicious for high grade urothelial carcinoma. And in our, during our review for validation of, for using the power system, our response also ranged from negative to high grade as well. And the biopsy showed grade three urothelial carcinoma and carcinoma in situ. So congratulations to the ones that called it high grade. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, these are just the images of the biopsy, as you can see there. This is the picture of the carcinoma in situ. So there's your carcinoma there. And here is this, is this smooth muscle, and here's the carcinoma. Uh, and our second case is from an 83-year-old male. Uh, clinical details of hematuria, and this is a urine from the renal pelvis. Uh, this is a very, this is a low grade, uh, uh, low grade, low power image of a sample. And as you can see, it's very busy, much more cellular than the last one. There's some crowded groups here, plenty of cytoplasm, some nucleoli present. A huge cluster of cells here, and then you've got all these what could may, maybe reactive, maybe yeah. cells. Uh, some papillary form uh, cell groups here. As you can see, there's some larger cells here, and another cluster of uh, cells with variable size and nuclei. There's a big one there, some small ones on the edges. Some more variable size nuclei, nucleoli present, clustered. A close up picture of uh, some more of the groups, some variable in size of the nuclei. So, same poll again. How would you class this? Negative for high grade, atypical urethelial cells, suspicious for high grade. High grade urothelial carcinoma, low grade urothelial neoplasm, or other? Okay, hey Winnie, could you just pop back to one or two of those images yes. while people are yeah. making their decision? And thank you. Let me just sort this out first. Okay, so uh, back, back, back here. Arrow, I think. This one? Yeah. Yeah, Quick there. That. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. So there we go again. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go that forward again. And I'll give it another sort of ten seconds or so, Winnie. We still got people answering, so yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. It's a tricky one.
Okay. Oh, quite an even spread, I think. So 17% thought it was negative, 15% thought atypical, 15% thought suspicious, 20% high grade, 27% thought it was low grade, which is the highest, and 6% thought it was other. So what, what is the answer? That is the question. Um, so, and then, so this was actually re originally reported suspicious of low grade, but with the power system, it would have gone out as negative for high grade with a text suggesting that low grade cannot be excluded. And when we were validating using the power system, we also range from negative to high grade as well. So, and the biopsy actually showed a follicular lymphoma, grade one. And if you go back, to, if you remember looking at the pictures, the NC ratio did not really reach 0.5 at all and uh, obviously you didn't get to see the whole s slide but there were no fibrovascular cores present in that sample so technically it would go in as negative now as someone who comes from cervical background looking at that sample i personally would not be happy with putting that in a negative uh, category without passing on to someone else so I think that's the key take home message is um, if you're not sure is to pass it on and discuss it with other clinicians. And I should also point out that the uroscopy for this patient had described a suspicious change in the renal pelvis, but there was no obvious lesion. So in summary, uh, the skills that I've learned from cervical screening is very easily transferable to reporting diagnostic cytology cases. And with the variety of pathologies and different kind of classifications that will be used for um, reporting uh, diagnostic cytology, there requires a recalibration of my thresholds, especially for negatives to see, because you need to be able the negatives look a bit more weird in a way than uh, in cervical smears and it's important when establishing BMS reporting in any department is to ensure that train cases of pathologists in training are given to them negative cases as well as the positive ones and thank you very much and uh, are there any questions Hi Winnie, thank you very much for a very interesting case and again beautiful photo of, or images anyway of the cells, they, they look lovely. Um, I do have a couple of questions have come up. So can the trainee pathology sign the case out after they do a second negative screen in your system? If I call it negative and the trainee pathologist calls it negative, then if they're comfortable, yes, they can sign well, it. Well, I think at the moment we're still trialling that it would still come to a consultant because trainees, are, depending on their level, are not currently signing, signing stuff out independently. So it'd be odd to create this particular thing for them. But it is something we're, we're looking at and we'll discuss with them. So okay. Um, okay. And then another question. Okay, uh, why, why there is the pilaroid fragment with cohesive cells? Do you find lymphoglandulous bodies in urine also? I think that's in relation to the, to the last case there. To the last case, the pillory form groups? Yeah, and also do you find lymphoglandular bodies in urine in a case of lymphoid? Well, that's the second one. I didn't uh, with that one. Um, I think there was just a couple of those papillary form groups, and the the NC ratio in the parasystem is the key factor. And the fact of the matter was the NC ratio for those particular groups did not reach 0.5. So in reality, it looked like a very reactive sample in itself, especially with the nucleoli present and everything. So it would be a negative case. 
But like I said, it is very counterintuitive to actually call something like that negative. But in Paris okay. it is. There were yeah. fibrovascular cause anyway. There were no fibrovascular cause. Yeah. yeah. Thing for a low grade, fibrovascular cause has to be present. Okay, okay. There is another, um, I think this is kind of like a, a comment rather a question, but I think it's still relevant. Um, in the case where the urothelial cells have weird reactive changes like those nucleoli, but that needs a response that is outside of the Paris system and need to be able to um, get into the clinical pathological correlation to find out what the urothelial cells are reacting to. I think that's probably more a comment than a, yeah. than a question. And then how would you assess NC ratio? Well, that's the thing. NC ratio is very difficult to assess, but uh, we can have a chart to see with pictures of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and it, I guess it's an experience thing that you build up this memory bank of what your tolerances are. And uh, like I said, we did a review of 75 cases, and the majority of them we did sort of like report the same for each case and anything difficult or different we would discuss it's like any other cytology case we would if we had difficulty allocating a category to it we would discuss it with someone else okay I, the truth yeah. is um as human beings, we're not very good at assessing ratios of areas. We're very good at assessing ratios of, of, of a, a single dimension, um, but not as areas. And I think there's presumably a evolutionary reason why we, have, we can't do that, but it is very difficult. If you show somebody two circles, one's half the diameter to the other, a lot of people won't say that the area is a quarter of the other, which is what it is. So I think if you're going to do it accurately, then you probably do have to have a chart that says, well, this is what a cell with a 0.5 ratio looks like. Mm. Okay. Um... Uh, comment there, should we not include this in the other group? Uh, well, that was the reporting it's group. Not but it's not malignancy. There's no malignant cells in the actual urine sample. Yeah, it's not. what's in the urine sample. There was no indication. Obviously, that was just a snapshot of the sample, but that was representative of the sample. There was nothing in the sample to indicate a lymphoma. Yeah. Okay, uh, there is another comment again around ratio, but I think you might have answered that, but um, I don't know, Bridget, if you want to just come in and, and just let me know whether that has been answered in the discussion there about ratio. Um, and what preparations do you use for urine cytology? Do you make clots to look for fibrovascular cause? Yeah, well, we use a standard cytospin. We, we basically centrifuge down to a pellet and then cytospin it to create the um, monolayer cells. Okay, that's fine. And then there was a question here about when you did the first poll about the NC ratio for the images A to D, what was the ratio for image D? For image D, that was 0.4. Right. 0 0.5 and 0 0.4 are very close to get that. Yeah. I think we mentioned earlier, it's very difficult for us to actually gauge NC ratio. It actually went from A was 0 0.7, B was 0 0.6, C was 0 0.5 and D was 0.4. Okay, so again, I think people are just trying to map to um, their own diagnosis here. Uh, yeah. If one diagnoses this case as atypical urothelial cells, would it be wrong? Which case? Case one or case two? I'm guessing case two, actually. Case two. If it, if you they don't say it, but it, that's what I'm guessing. Yeah, because basically for case two, uh, the ratio of the, N the NC ratio was not greater than 0.5. It was a very busy sample, but if you had a closer look at the, um, the NC ratio, none of them could get up to 0.5, really. And I know I, I pointed out there's nucleoli present and everything, but that's not a um, feature of the Paris classification, of the presence of nucleoli. So I think it's a case of uh, filtering out how, because 
anyone in a, who's done screening before knows that a busy sample can be the most tricky to mm. assess because you've got everything going on in the background as well. It's just filtering out what's going on in the background. And uh, I have to admit, when I first looked at that, I thought, oh my God, there's something going on here. But, yeah. Um, I think once you drill down to the NC ratio, they are less than 0.5. So it cannot go into the, according to Paris, it cannot go into an atypical category. Okay. And again, it's about applying that, that Paris system into it. Um, just two more now. One is of the first case was the tumor in the bladder or ureteric pelvis. Yeah, Do you know. Ureter. Ureter. Yeah. Okay, Isn't ureter. And then um, the last coming there for the Paris classification. Do you categorize according to the worst NC ratio present, even if in a single cell of the sample? or the predominant NC ratio present? It's, uh, it's like in cervical cytology, it's the worst case scenario. So obviously if you've got one cell that is so like 0.7, very hyperchromatic, abnormal chromatin, you'll have to put it, even though it's obviously high grade, and if it was only just one cell, that would be in the suspicious category rather than so like low grade if you've got fibrovascular cores. But if you've got that one cell that is 0.7 or above, it would be in the suspicious for high grade. Okay, that is great, thank you. So I think we'll close out there again, lots of interesting comments there and questions. So thank you again, Winnie, and we'll move on to the next case. So let me just... Hello, yeah, so I'm just uh, getting the next presentation up. I'll, I'll, yes, I'll try and do that. Uh, okay. okay, so just share the screen again. Um, Okay, that's great. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, are we there? Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. So I'd like to introduce, sorry, uh, Dr. Violet Albert, who's a ST2 histopathology uh, in Helm Hempstead, and she's going to come and talk about another dual fluid cytology. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, um, as Tony mentioned, I'm Violet Albert. I'm one of the ST2s here at Hemel Hempstead and I'm going to talk you through another pleural fluid cytology. So the patient at the centre of this case is an 88-year-old lady with multiple comorbidities, including previous stroke, heart failure, hypertension, hypothyroidism and osteoarthritis. She presented with a two-week history of worsening shortness of breath on exertion. She was an ex-smoker with a 50-pack year smoking history. Here we have two chest radiographs side by side. On the left is an old baseline chest X-ray taken one month prior to admission. And on the right is this lady's admission chest X-ray. As you can see, she has a massive right-sided pleural effusion. Pleural fluid was taken for cytology. This is the diff quick preparation. As you can see, the initial smear had a very bloody background with very few cells seen. These are some of the cells that were identified, some with very uniform round nuclei and bland chromatin. Um, as you can see here, and others with more hyperchromatic nuclei and less cytoplasm, as you can see that. Um, and you can see some more of the cells that were identified here. This is the PAP stain slide. Again, it's not particularly cellular. And these are some of the other cells that were seen. Again, the appearances vary. There are cells with bony cytoplasm resembling macrophages and hyperchromatic clusters of cells, um, such as these, with minimal cytoplasm as seen previously. Um, now time for a poll. Um, if you were looking at this, how would you proceed? So, would you report the specimen is inadequate and request repeat sampling? 
Would you report that no malignant cells were identified? Would you report that malignant cells were identified but further sampling is needed? Or request a cell block and further preparations? I'll give another 10 seconds or so, Violet, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, um, so there's a bit of a mix. So 6% of each said that you would issue a report saying the specimen is inadequate and request, request repeat sampling. 3% um, stated that you'd issue a report saying that no malignant cells were identified. 22% said malignant cells are identified but a further sample is needed. And the vast majority, 69%, would request a cell block and further preparations. So we requested further preparations. Oh, that one. Right, we requested yeah. further preparations and a cell block, as although there were some highly atypical cell groups, the number was insufficient for us to definitely move forward with the diagnosis of malignancy. So these were the groups that we were concerned about. Um, as you can see, they had minimal cytoplasms, hypochromatic nuclei, and in areas as you can see here, for example, and here, they're stacking on top of each other. Nucleoli are not a prominent feature. We requested a repeat preparation, which showed the following. So this is the repeat smear, and this is the diff quick preparation. As you can see, the repeat preparation was substantially more cellular than the previous, with numerous cytological atypical cells arranged as groups of various sizes and singly. And this is a diff quick preparation on high power. This is a high power view of the groups on the PAP. Again, in the centre of the group, sometimes it can be a little tricky to see into, but the, nu the nuclear features are discernible if you look towards the cells at the edges. Okay, so now another poll. Um, at this point, what would be your favourite diagnosis? Would it be A, a non-neoplastic condition, B, mesothelioma, C, small cell carcinoma, D, lobular breast carcinoma, or E, colorectal adenocarcinoma? So I'll give you a bit of time. Okay, so 1% um, thought it would be a, would favour a non-neoplastic condition, 3% would favour mesothelioma, and um, the vast majority, 80%, would favour small cell carcinoma, 11% lobular breast carcinoma, and 5% would favour colorectal adenocarcinoma. So our initial suspicion was that this was a form of lung cancer given the location, morphology and smoking history and lack of symptoms in, in the clinical history to suggest another primary site. And the morphology was suggestive of small cell carcinoma. Yeah, yeah, click there. Yeah. Okay. The initial smear preparations and the repeat smear preparations differed quite dramatically in terms of the number of atypical cells present and the amount of blood present. This could be attributed to how the specimens are processed for cytology. 
When a sample is put into a centrifuge, it separates into three layers. There's a relatively acellular plasma layer on the surface, red blood cells at the bottom of the tube, and a buffy layer in the middle, where tumor cells and inflammatory cells end up. In order to make the smear, a cytology practitioner will prepare to drop from the buffy layer onto the slide. Now, if for whatever reason the pipetted sample is taken too far into the tube, there will be numerous red blood cells and fumar tumor cells. So this is how the sample looked on a cell block. And again, you can see these clustered hypochromatic groups. And here are some more. And you can see how the nuclei are arranged um, sort of with respect to each other as well. Immunocytochemistry was performed and showed the following. MNF116 showed dot positivity in the atypical cells. Now adjacent to them, you can see a ring of benign mesothelial cells, which have more diffuse strong positivity for MNF116, as you can see here. Um, NCAM, so CD56, and TTF1 both showed strong diffuse positivity in the malignant cells. And GATA3, P40, calretinin, and synaptophysin were all negative in the atypical cells. So um, just another poll now to see if you've moved away from your preferred diagnosis. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the options are squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, adenocarcinoma of the lung, small cell carcinoma of the lung, and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung. Okay, so the results of the poll, 2% um, um, would favour squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, 20% would favour adenocarcinoma of the lung, 73% would favour small cell carcinoma of the lung, and 5% would favour large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung. So at this point, our favourite diagnosis was oh, yeah, small cell carcinoma of the lung. Now, if we go back to the image of the cells we saw previously, we can see that there are some characteristic features, such as nuclear moulding due to the increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. The chromatin has that distinctive, finely granular appearance, and the nucleoli are not prominent. Also, in areas, the cells line up with regards to each other, and this has been compared to a vertebral column. So with small cell lung cancer, um, often you may expect neuroendocrine markers to be positive. However, in up to two thirds may actually be negative for chromogram and synaptophysin. And there have been rare cases where all neuroendocrine markers are negative and the diagnosis can still be made if the morphology is diagnostic. With regards to how this lady was managed, she was discussed at the lung MDT and a CT scan was conducted. Um, CT showed multiple pleural nodules and pleural thickening with a possible primary lesion in the apical segment of the right lower lobe. Numerous lymph nodes were involved. This was staged as PT4, N3, M1A, small cell carcinoma of the lung. She was given a three month prognosis and has been managed conservatively with best supportive care given frailty and disease burden. So this graph here um, shows a number of cases of small cell lung cancer diagnosed on pleural fluid since 2017 in West Hearts. Now, as you can see, 2020 has five cases, which is quite a lot considering these have all actually been since June. 
And um, anecdotally, um, other colleagues are also starting to report seeing cancers presenting at higher stages, such as perforated bowel cancer. Now, this trend may be attributable to a number of reasons. Um, people may be anxious around attending healthcare settings due to COVID. Um, patients may have had pre first presentations missed due to stopping clinics during the national lockdown. Um, there's a current strain on clinics, and particularly in this case of lung cancer, there is a strong possibility that patients may attribute their symptoms to coronavirus and heed the current advice to stay home if so. So in terms of learning points, um, I wanted to share the wearer hemorrhagic background as it can mask and distort cellular morphology and also how variation in preparation of slides can lead to dramatic differences in cellularity and diagnostic utility. Also, things to bear in mind for a diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, um, these cells having a high NC ratio, which gives rise to nuclear molding, as seen in both cytology and histology specimens. The chromatin has a distinctive, finely granular salt and pepper character, and cell size being a less important diagnostic clue, as one could easily find a medium-sized small cell lung cancer. When looking at small cell lung cancer in effusion samples, the cells often stack on top of each other and flatten slightly, as we saw earlier, and these chain formations can look similar to lobular breast carcinoma, which is one of the differentials here. And here are some references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Violet. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I have a few questions, if that's okay. One is, what method are you using for cell block preparation? Uh, we use, we make, we spin the pellet down and we use thrombin and plasma to make a clot. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a comment here about what do people think about taking cells from the buffy layer? Um, they found the dilutions are much more representative. I don't know whether that's one for comment. What was the question again? It wasn't really a question, it was just, well, I suppose, yeah, what thought on, on taking cells from the buffy layer? They find that dilutions are much more representative. I think they mean, um, I presume that the dilutions made from the buffy layer are more representative. Yeah, the, the would be the vast majority of the cells would be in that buffy layer because mm because obviously the red blood cells will be a lot heavier than the um, diagnostic cells that we're after, hence why the red blood cells would sink to the bottom after centrifugation. And it depends on how big a pellet you will get after centrifugation as well, because sometimes it can be tricky to see where that buffy layer is, which could explain why some, sometimes you do get a lot of um, red blood cells in the preparation. Uh, there are ways to remove the red blood cells and we are looking into that to improve our um, preparation techniques. Okay, yeah, actually comment back on that was that they found the buffy layer to be very open to human error and I think that was made reference to as well by Violet in that presentation. Okay, there any more? Yeah, again, what about treating blood stain samples with cytolite to remove the blood cells? Um, yeah, I suppose it depends on your preparation method that you use, whether you use thin prep or cytospin. Yeah, and also there's the issue about um, using histopaque or lymph prep, so density mm. gradients. A, we, we're looking at all of those things at the moment. Yeah, I know when I worked in the lab, we used um, for fresh samples, we did use um, histopaque and we got some good results. But again, yeah. there's an element of um, technical expertise in taking that. It's still a coat, a buffy coat as well, for all intents and purposes of, of I suppose, sampling all the sample there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is there any more questions? Okay. Okay, yeah. so should we... Nothing else coming in there, yeah, so we'll, we'll go on to the next on. case, thank you. Okay, so the next person I'd like to introduce is uh, Dr. Sabina Mistry, who's a local consultant here. I'll just share her screen. Okay, so you want... Oh, 
Shanti. Okay, I guess. Thanks, Tony, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, and um, I'm here today to present an interesting case uh, for today's webinar. My talk is entitled, What's the Point of Rose eBus? So just to give you a bit of background um, about eBus, so eBus is endobronchial ultrasound. It's a minimally invasive procedure and it usually targets the mediastinal, hyla or interlobar lymph nodes. Current NICE guidelines recommend eBus to facilitate not only the diagnosis, but also it facilitates the staging and therefore the further management for the patient but providing a ROSE service is not necessary. So ROSE, um, here at West Hearts, we do offer a ROSE service. So ROSE stands for Rapid On-Site Evaluation, and it can be compared much like um, a frozen section for tissue. So we offer a ROSE service to our clinicians, um, which has been offered since the introduction of eBus uh, a few years ago. So the service is usually led by a consultant cytopathologist and it's assisted by a cytotechnician. It's one of the few services that are offered within the UK. And again, as I mentioned before, it can facilitate ancillary testing. By providing a row service, we can reduce the number of sites that are targeted. But um, with all of these advantages, there are obviously disadvantages too, such as the time and cost implications of offering a row service. Uh, usually the team are away, can be away for at least half a day. So obviously this can have an impact on other services that are provided within the department. So the process of eBus. So tissue is uh, retrieved using ultrasound guidance. Um, a fine gauge needle is inserted through the wall of an airway into the lymph node to be able to retrieve tissue. So the material is directly deposited onto a label glass slide and smeared using another slide. One slide is immediately stained with DIFQUIC and evaluated for adequacy in diagnosis and if another pass is necessary or if material for a cell block can be obtained. The other slide that was used to smear the uh, material is preserved in alcohol for perhaps staining later on. So now moving on to the case. So I'm going to present a case of a 43 year old man who was found to have um, high uptake on his PET scan in the right hilum and right lower lobe of the lung. So just from the clinical information provided, there is already a strong suspicion for a possible lung cancer with involvement of the lymph nodes, making this a possible stage N1. Before I show you the images from the case, I just wanted to quickly discuss what an adequate EBUS is. So as you can see from this slide, there are lots of different definitions for what people would consider an adequate EBUS. And they range from a preponderance of lymphocytes to seeing more than 40 lymphocytes per times 40 field, any pigmented macrophages, or having diagnostic material. And diagnostic material is usually interpreted as having any malignant cells uh, seen on the slide. So now these are the images from the case, and this is from the first pass. So you can see this is a low power image. You can appreciate that it's quite heavily blood stained and poorly cellular. There are scanty lymphocytes and possibly a group of benign bronchial epithelial cells. So there's not really enough material to even call this adequate sampling of a lymph node. So on this basis, another pass was undertaken. So this is the material obtained from the second pass. So you can appreciate the difference, even at low power, how cellular um, this image is. So you can see that we've got some cohesive groups um, and there's some scattered single cells in the background. I guess you have to ask yourself, could these scattered single cells be lymphocytes? So here is a high power image, uh, a higher power image. So here you can appreciate there are irregular groups. The cells appear to have a high NC ratio and they appear to be quite hypochromatic. So here's a high power image of these cells. So you can see that the nuclei are demonstrating uh, nuclei atypia. There's minimal cytoplasm, but importantly, no nucleoli are seen, and there's no evidence of keratinization. And the single cells that we saw at low power appear to be the same as those seen in the groups. So they appear to be atypical. And there appears to be some 
debris or perhaps even necrotic material in the background. So now just moving on to the one and only poll. So if you just think, if you were doing this Rose eBus, what would you do? What would you call this? So your options are, would you call this benign or equivocal? And then make slides from further passes to make the diagnosis. Do you think that this is a small cell carcinoma? Do you think that this is a non-small cell carcinoma, but you would need to make slides from further passes to refine the diagnosis? Or do you think that this is a non-small cell carcinoma and you would advise further passes from this site and you would stop making slides? So I'll just give you some time to answer that question. Oh, right. So we have the results of the poll. So 7% of people that answered think that this is benign and they would require further, uh, they would require further passes to make the diagnosis. 15% of people think this is a small cell carcinoma. 12% of people think that this is a non-small cell carcinoma and they would make slides from further passes to re help refine the diagnosis. And most people have gone for the fourth option, 66%, uh, and they think that this is a non-small cell carcinoma and they'd advise further passes from this site for cell block, but they would cease to make slides. And that is actually the correct answer. So moving on. <laughs> so that's exactly what we did. So this is a non-small cell carcinoma. Um, we stopped making slides and we took material for a cell block and this is a low power image of the cell block. So again, you can appreciate the groups that we saw on, on the cytology images, they're present in the cell block and here you can um, appreciate that they actually appear glandular, there's a bit of cribber forming and we have these atypical cells. So if we just go back and compare that to the original cytology images, there's a hint, I mean a hint of a glandular formation there, which you can obviously appreciate on the cell block. So we undertook some immunocytochemistry. So along the lines of that this could possibly be a lung adenocarcinoma, we did a TTF1, which you can see is negative in all of those atypical cells. A CK7, again, atypical in all of the um, atypical groups, but we do have a group of positive bronchial epithelial cells acting as a good internal control here. So now the question is, we've gone down the route of thinking that this could potentially be a lung adenocarcinoma, but both of our markers are negative. Now what do we do? So this was omitted from the clinical history, but on searching further, we found that in 2017, this patient had actually been diagnosed with a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma of the sigmoid colon, and it had been resected. So with that information, a CK20 was undertaken, again, strongly positive in all of those atypical cells. A CDX2, again, strongly positive. So with all of that information, this was the final diagnosis as given on the report. So the first pass was deemed insufficient. The second pass was diagnosed as an adenocarcinoma and the cell block in immunohistochemistry were in keeping with an adenocarcinoma consistent with a colorectal primary. So triaging Rose eBus cases. So this was a good case which demonstrated the main points of Rose eBus, primarily that the specimen is adequate uh, it's adequate, it's malignant, and that it's a non-small cell carcinoma. 
Further evaluation was undertaken confirming adenocarcinoma and that it was of colorectal origin. So molecular testing uh, was not undertaken in this case. It's also important to highlight that at the time of Rose, further subtyping is not necessary, but the need to differentiate between a non-small cell carcinoma and small cell carcinoma is the most important issue. So the key learning points from this case, um, the need to check any previous history, uh, specifically imaging or clinical letters available. And in this case, it was able to guide uh, further immunocytochemistry to provide a diagnosis in this case and to ensure that the patient wasn't incorrectly um, diagnosed as having a lung adenocarcinoma. This case also highlights that EBUS ideally pro uh, provides a diagnosis and staging at the same procedure. And just some more learning points. Um, the fact that we are able to provide a row service allows for decisions to be made in real time in endoscopy and therefore in forms of targeting for the clinicians. By using, a row, by using rows during EBUS, we can reduce the number of sites that are targeted and we can allow for the appropriate triaging of the sample and also maximizing material for further tests such as cell block and molecular testing. And just to end, in an ideal world with plentiful cytopathologists and trained BMSs, every center would provide a row service for eBus, but we know that it's obviously not possible. Um, the references. And I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Rubin, who originally reported this case, and Dr. Maddox for helping with the selection of this case and uh, reviewing the presentation, and to the BAC for the opportunity to present a case here today for the webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sabrina, there again. That was a very interesting case. And I have to say all the images today have been fabulous. So um, it's great, thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions come through. Um, when making the air dry, these probably are related actually, I think, I don't know if someone's answered the question for you. Uh, when making the air dry spread in clinic, do you target specific material in the sample to put on the slide or just sample randomly? And then I have a comment here that the mixed sample to homogenize and take a small sample for the prep at rows and that leaves samples put into washings for auxiliary testing. Yeah. I mean, what, what we do is all, all the material from each aspirate goes into a, a single dry container, which is we use a, a Petri dish. And then um, the solid stuff that you can pick up with forceps goes straight into formalin, the cell block. The, um, we then take... No, the no, 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 one drop onto each of two slides, uh, and we spread those, and one of those is okay, okay, okay. Um, okay. the air dried, and we make a diff quick at that time. And then everything else in the petri dish that's bloody, that isn't solid, it, we hoover up with saline and put into a, uh, a container, which is then spun down for cell block later. So the vast majority of material actually ends up in cell block, uh, but we, we, we use small amounts of material to do the, the rows within the clinic. Okay, is that? Uh... Okay, yeah, sorry, my, my connection went a little bit there, so I didn't fully get that, but hopefully you've answered that question. Part of um, that also said, the, the, um, the question there was about um, that they sometimes put small amount, sorry, they take a sample for each, um, each pass and then they can decide whether uh, if it's blood stain to separate that out from the material that they might the diagnostic material that they might use i think is what they were saying um okay. the, um what is it again this is is there time during the procedure to wait for assessments on adequacy from each pass our bms has found that the material comes at them faster than they can comment well, there are two of us. Uh, I mean, you can certainly have a, a team. You will need a team of two, and there can be two BMSs or a BMS and a consultant, depending on what your resources are. I have done it myself, uh, both making the slides and looking at the things, but it is very tricky to do all of that. Um, but certainly, I mean, our, our clinicians sometimes use two needles and alternate them so it comes really quickly. Uh, but if there are two of you there, one of you can make the preps and the other can be looking at them. Looking so at it, them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. There's another. Um, oh, Question here, do you send all the molecular tests, example, EGFR, ALK, ROS1 and PDL1 at once? I presume, is uh, there a stratification that you use or 
No, no, no. We, if, it, if the tumour is appropriate for those tests, we send them all at the same time, yeah. Okay. Um, and then someone's asking here um, to another participant, but you might be able to answer this as well. Do you have a way of decreasing the blood content of washings at source? Uh, washing uh, well, um, we would be able to. We we don't we don't in endoscopy. No, not at the moment. Not not there. No. I mean, we can do stuff back in the lab, and we're looking at that, but uh, not not in the clinic. Right. Okay. I think that's it. I'm not. I'll just go a quick gun through and make sure I haven't missed any there. Okay. So to type in any of the questions, but in the meantime, again, I'd like to yeah, thank all our, pre presenta so our presenters to today. I, as I say, I think they've been brilliant cases and the images have been fabulous. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the last presentation for today, I'd like to, um, uh, let me just get the, share, the screen sharing going first before I... Uh, before, right. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Yash Karia, um, and he's an ST3 uh, trainee in histopathology, cellular pathology at uh, Hemel Hempstead, and he's going to talk about this. Okay, so hi, my name is Yash, I'm an ST3 in pathology at Hemel Hempstead. Um, Okay, so I'll be presenting a case of a rapid on-site evaluation of a pancreatic FNA and a core biopsy. Um, so this case concerned a 47-year-old man who had a past medical history of a left transitional cell carcinoma with a nephrouretorectomy, which was performed in 2016. In January this year, he presented with vomiting, weight loss, and inability to keep any food down. So on CT scan, there was gastric outlet obstruction, and on OGD, there was a pinhole stricture within the proximal duodenum. A biopsy of this area showed active chronic inflammation and ectopic pancreatic tissue, but with no atypical features. He then underwent a gastrojejunostomy and made a good recovery. So unfortunately, he represented in September 2020 with worsening abdominal pain and inability to keep any food down again. So a CT scan was performed, which showed peripancreatic fat stranding and some soft tissue along the central mesenteric vessels. So um, the image on the screen is his um, abdominal CT. So a couple of possibilities was raised, whether this could be IgG4 disease or malignancy. So uh, he then went on to have a endoscopic ultrasound scan, which showed a pancreatic head lesion but because he had um, pyloric stenosis, this is not possible to sample. So a further procedure was required to assess this area. So then he did, went on to have a CT guided um, uh, procedure. So uh, you can see the needle um, targeting the pancreas there. So, and FNA was performed first. So this is the first pass of the fine needle aspirate cytology. So on the left is the diff-quick preparation. So this is very good for on-site evaluation. And this is what we would see on site. So it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy to perform, only requires three solutions. So uh, the following day, the PAP came out, which is a more definitively stained slide. But unfortunately, as you can see, it's only, it, it only shows blood. So the decision was made uh, during that time to go for a second pass. So this is the second pass. Again, it just shows blood and debris. So this was a cell block that came out the following day. So you can see some benign pancreatic asinite within a background of blood, but no real atypical cells were seen. So because the aspirate was only blood stained, uh, the decision was made to proceed with a core biopsy. So once the core biopsy was taken, it was dabbed on the microscope slide and uh, to try and derive some cells from it. So this process is known as touch preparation cytology. So touch preparation cytology, very briefly, is just where a small amount of tissue is taken, is placed or dragged on a microscope slide to extract some, uh, to extract some cells. 
and to make a cytology preparation. Again, this would be done using a diff quick stain. So very simplistically put, um, there's three ways of deriving cells from the core biopsy. So um, there's a drag method where uh, the tissue is quite literally dragged along the slide. There's a roll method where, again, the tissue is rolled. Uh, if, if, if the core biopsy is quite small, um, quite fragile, then you have to be a bit careful to try and stabilize and protect the core biopsy, perhaps by putting it on a uh, plastic needle cover. Um, also, there's the touch and pick method, which was used in this case where the core biopsy is literally picked up and imprinted on various aspects of the slide. So again, if the core biopsy is quite thin, uh, then it's probably best using like a small needle or a thin plastic stick to try and protect um, the core biopsy because forceps can sometimes um, damage it. So the advantages of touch preparation cytology is that it permits rapid on-site evaluation of the biopsy. It allows for immediate evaluation of specimens for triage and diagnosis. So if you identify any malignant cells, on the touch preparation cytology, then uh, it, you, know, you, you have a diagnosis fairly quickly. It's rapid and easy to perform, and there's less artifacts caused by um, freezing, formalin, or summering, which you might get in other types of preparations, for instance. So the disadvantages in touch preparation cytology is that um, although you don't get smearing artifact, uh, as you might expect with fine needle aspirate, um, sometimes there can be um, sort of uh, the preparation can be a bit thick and there may be some false clustering of cells. Also, if the um, core biopsy is pressed quite vigorously on the slide, then there may be um, forced discohesion of cells, then there may be forced discohesion of cells, which can uh, slightly uh, make evaluating cytology a bit tricky. Uh, there's also a small risk of uh, damage to the core biopsy itself when forcefully imprinting tissue and um, it's not touch preparation cytology is not great for fibrous lesions that do not give away cells very easily. So this is the first touch preparation cytology um, so from, from, from the core biopsy. So um, you can see on the slide the general outline of the core biopsy. So unfortunately it's not very cellular um, so I have dotted a um, sort of a single group of cells. So on your screen, uh, you can see all the um, atypical looking groups of cells that were present on the slide. Um, so there's only three atypical um, groups of cells um, that we identified. So um, they show quite significant variation in nuclear size. So the group in the middle shows um, that the largest cell is probably perhaps um, four times as big as the smallest cell in that group. There's irregular chromatin, uh, scant cytoplasm as well. So based on these images, um, what's your interpretation and what should be done next? So is this benign? So no need to repeat the core biopsy. Is this benign? Repeat core biopsy to get more material would be a good idea. Is this malignant? So um, no need to repeat core biopsy. Or is this malignant, but nonetheless, repeating core biopsy to get more material might be a good idea. So uh, this, is, this is another poll. I have been asked, can we get the images back again, please? Thank you. Okay, so the results 
uh, say that, so 1% thought that it was benign, um, no need to repeat the core biopsy, 3% thought benign, but after repeating the core biopsy to get more material is advisable, 40% thought malignant and wouldn't repeat the core biopsy. Uh, the, the majority, however, thought um, malignant and repeating core biopsy to get more material is a good idea. And this is the option that we went through, um, the last one. So we thought that um, these probably looked malignant, these groups. However, due to the scant nature of such groups, uh, and the, the sort of, it was quite falsely cellular, so we decided to uh, request for another, another um, core biopsy. Um, so this is the second um, touch preparation. Um, so this is a touch preparation cytology from the second core biopsy. So as you can see, it's slightly more cellular uh, than the first. Again, we have markedly atypical groups um, showing clear morphic nucle uh, nuclei, um, irregular chromatin and um, conspicuous nucleoli. We also came across these groups. So if you can see my arrow, the group in the middle um, shows um, quite regular nuclei with um, some amount of granular cytoplasm. And there are two other groups to the left and right of this group. So um, this sort of the group to the left and right show um, slightly bigger nuclei with more abundant microvacuolated cytoplasm. And a similar picture is uh, presented here. Again, the nuclei are quite big with abundant microvacuolated cytoplasm. So based on this image, um, what do you think this represents? Is this pancreatic ductal carcinoma? Is this normal pancreatic asini? Or is this normal uh, pancreatic islets? I'll give about 10 more seconds, uh, Doctor, if that's okay. That's great. Okay, so the majority thought pancreatic ductal carcinoma, 57%, 21% um, uh, thought normal pancreatic asini and 22% normal pancreatic islets. So that's a really interesting feedback because um, actually what we were trying to represent here um, was sort of the more normal pancreatic structures. So, um, so I'll just show a um, core um, sort of um, images from the um, core biopsy of the patient. So this is the histology. And the um, group of cells on the bottom of your screen where my arrow is, is what the previous cytology represented. So this is just normal pancreatic um, islets. Uh, you can see the regular nuclei. I mean, they look um, perhaps slightly bigger than the normal pancreatic asini in the surrounding, but there is, um, they have abundant um, cytoplasm, which also appears slightly microvacuolated. Um, so the normal asini surrounding um, the normal pancreatic islets show um, slightly less cytoplasm, but which is, uh, slight, which is more granular in nature. So I'll just go back to the image again. So this in the middle appears like normal pancreatic um, asini, whereas uh, to the left and right uh, look like pancreatic islets. Uh, again, a nice picture demonstrating um, pancreatic islets to the left uh, and asini to the right. So just going back to the cytology again, these, this again, another normal structure. So this looks like um, pancreatic ductal cells. So they have a nice sheet-like arrangement without significant overlapping and the nuclei are regular in size. 
So going to the core biopsy of the patient again, so on the top right, we have uh, normal uh, pancreatic structures, so normal pancreatic ductal epithelium on the right here, and then normal pancreatic acini over here. And moving along the core, however, um, so there is definitely um, ir irregularity. So there are nests of atypical cells uh, with conspicuous nucleoli set within desmoplastic stroma. So um, yes, I mean, you're right to think it was pancreatic ductal carcinoma, uh, but uh, unfortunately those images didn't represent that, but there is definitely pancreatic ductal carcinoma uh, within the core biopsy. So uh, we also did mismatch repair on this and it showed quite interesting results. So on the left is MLH1 and PMS2. So this shows retained staining, whereas on the right, uh, we have MSH2 and MSH6. So this shows loss of, um, loss of staining. So this patient has uh, mismatch repair deficiency. Um, now this is very interesting because um, this is quite rare. So 90% of pancreatic ductal carcinomas are KRAS uh, mutated, 10% are KRAS wild type. And of those 10% which are KRAS um, wild type, a fifth show um, loss of mismatch repair staining. So that's 2% of all pancreatic ductal carcinomas. And this patient happens to be one of them. So this patient could possibly receive immunotherapy, uh, which is slightly good news for him. Also, the mismatch repair deficiency may also account for the fact um, for his um, uh, transitional cell carcinoma he had in 2016, which I mentioned at the very start of the uh, presentation. So to summarize, ROSE is not simply a tool for adequacy and diagnosis, but it's vital for decision making. So in that, um, if we weren't there during the uh, rapid onsite evaluation of the pancreatic FNA, we would never have known there and then that it's blood stained and the decision wouldn't have been made um, to proceed to core biopsy uh, there and then um, without, without the ROSE. So next point is that um, ROSE can also be performed on biopsy. So as we saw in terms of touch preparation cytology, uh, in, in addition to conventional cytology, and finally, think MMR deficiency in multiple site cancers. Um, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you again for, for a very interesting presentation. And I have to say, there were some very bird like images in some of those um, touch preps there as well. Certainly, like a swan head, I thought, on, on one of them. Uh, lovely. Um, Okay, I do have a few questions. So um, now um, I don't know if anyone can answer. I have a couple of questions here, but I did actually get thrown out. So uh, Louise might be able to come in with some earlier questions. There. The testing done in this patient, is it done routinely in all cases? But I think you answered that actually with regard to um, your mention of multiple or previous um, tumours, so... Um... There's just one thing to add to that, which is what, as Yash said, 90% um, of pancreatic carcinoma patients are KRAS mutated and the other 10% are wild type. So the, the, the route that's probably going to come about is that you test them for KRAS first, and if they're KRAS negative, then you can do MMR. Uh, the truth is, in this case, we had a discussion with the oncologist and they said, oh, can you do KRAS and MMR? So. So we did. So it's, it's a sort of an evolving pathway, really. OK. And are there immunos to show difference between pancreatic and gastric? Probably no more than that than I do. Um, I don't think that, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think there are. Not, no, not, as, not as far as I'm aware, no. Yeah. OK, that's great. Louise, I don't know if you can see any of the previous chat. I think there were a few questions came up that I... I can't see now because I was thrown out and had to come back in. And somebody's asking about what's the point of MMR, I think. Yeah, I think we've done that one. Um, there was some earlier thing. I don't know if yeah. these are still... Yeah, they can... It means that the oh, principle... Oh, yeah, therapy. the are still there. Yeah. I think ours has gone. To that... Oh yeah, there you go. 
Apologies, I unfortunately, I was thrown out there. Yeah, don't worry. I think I think that's I can't see any other because I've got the questions here. Okay. I can't, see any. I can't see any other ones either. Okay, that's grand. So yeah, we've got what is the purpose of MMR on this one? Prognostic or predictive biomarkers? Yeah. Oh, there was one question. I, well, it was probably more of a comment about I think it was in relation to the request for an additional biopsy. Um, I think it was about the cell. Um, content of that first uh, touch prep that that was obviously just the outer part of the of the biopsy and I think that was probably related to that request for additional biopsy if it was actually necessary. Yes I mean it was a moot point there were those three atypical groups um, had we been feeling very gung-ho maybe we would have said okay that's enough because both biopsies were actually diagnostic but um, it, to be brutally honest about it that's only our second touch preparation core biopsy we've ever done. So um, and only about three weeks ago. So uh, we just felt that given that the patient was there, it was, and we didn't want to have another procedure, let's do another core. That's what we decided. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, and there was again, just some a question about that. The first biopsy I could thank. Was the first bi biopsy diagnosis of pancreatic heterotopia incidental? I think that was. I mean, that oh, was yeah, before. That was. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So I think now we're just getting uh, comments to say thank you and. Um, I'll just do a summing up, if that's all right. Yeah, um, that is brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'll try not to take it. I realise I'm slightly over time, so I'll be. I'll be help, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for logging on and all of that. I'd, I'd also like just to say something to the, to the trainee pathologists, particularly in the BMSs. Uh, and the first thing is just to say to the trainees, don't be afraid of cytology. Um, it's just another skill that you can acquire. It's not magic. It's neither good magic nor bad magic. You know, it's not witchcraft. It's not wizardry. It's nothing like that. And bear in mind that our consultant uh, colleagues, the radiologists, they train to interpret CT scans, MRI, plain x-rays, ultrasound, and they in all those different modalities that's just part of their skill and it's the same organs that you're looking at in the human body diagnostic cytopathology histopathology is looking at the same cells and the same tissues they're just acquired in slightly different ways and prepared in slightly different ways um, the only real difference i think is that in cytology you often are adding up lots of little bits of evidence as you're screening things rather than going to one big abnormality and characterizing it and you need to have a sort of mindset of Passivity but curiosity. You have to let the evidence flow into your brain but be curious about it as it happens and don't come try and jump for things. If you're happy with that process, then I think you'll be happy with cytology. Um, so as a trainee, take the opportunity to look at anything we've seen today. So where you've got uh, histopathology and diagnostic cytopathology uh, 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 on, the same, on, on the same preparation, then take the, the time to, to compare them and, and look at from both points of view. Um, for the BMSs, I would say you're very much part of the team. You're an integral part of the team and without cytotechnologists, biomedical scientists producing high quality preparations and ensuring that the right amount of stuff is available at rows when you're doing rows, then it's impossible for pathologists and, uh, and consultant biomedical scientists and anybody else with a diploma and advanced practice to, to do their reporting. So you know it's very much a, a team approach and the mindset for the trainees is also appropriate for you and finally i'd just like to say the, about the bac the, the bac is there to provide training and education for for everybody that practices cytopathology um, and cellular pathology and if you're not a member please consider joining uh, for trainees and bms's it's really cheap it's 30 pounds a year you know so um uh, uh, Kristen's already shared a link to do that. Um, we're here to provide training, education and support and we continue to do that uh, throughout the years with these webinars uh, and other uh, real meetings when we go back to doing that. So there you go. Thank you very much for, for coming along and um, I won't take up any more of your time. <laughs>